going through as a church, and I struggle trying to remember, okay, is this ICF? I try to put it, it, it. So, I'm getting better. I did it right this morning. <laughs> I'm really proud of it. No, we do welcome each one of you to Florence International Church this morning, and yes, this is the place to be. If, now, I know Tuscany is the place to be, and in Tuscany, Florence is the place to be, but I'll tell you what, right here is the place to be in Florence, so it tops everything. We're glad to have each one of you this morning, and I want to read from Psalm 71. It reads, starting verse 1, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. And I... The context of this particular psalm is a salvation one. The, the psalmist is going through a really difficult time. But you know, as I began to look at this particular psalm, I realized that over and over, there's a realization throughout the psalms that the Lord is my refuge. And when he's talking about being a refuge, it's, it's my place of Sabbath rest, sometimes it means. It's the place that we can go and just go, God, here I am in your presence. It's the place we can go when we wake up in the morning. And if we're not morning people, can kind of go, okay, God, I'm here. And we can lay our head down at night and say, Lord, you're my refuge. In your presence, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> and throughout the day, when God is our refuge, He's the one we can run to. Whether it's a difficult time, whether it's an incredible time, as we are looking around and maybe we're viewing the art, maybe we're viewing the scenery, and we're looking, wow, God, pulling away to God. God, you created this. Wow, incredible. You gave us the ability to create such beautiful arts, for such beautiful architecture. And to begin to learn how to pull away. God, you are my refuge. In you, O oh Lord, do I take refuge. For you are my rock and my fortress. Lord, we thank you that indeed in you we can find refuge. In you we can find rest. In you we can find contemplation. In you we can find things. In you, Lord, we find our everything. And so, Lord, we commit to you the service, our time of praise, our time of worship, our time of hearing from your word as we lean in to you and take refuge in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. Oh, bless your name. Glory to God. You are holy, Lord. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Take us into the holy of holies. 
today we proclaim your holiness. We proclaim that you are worthy. You are worthy of our love. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy, Lord, because you are holy. And in this moment, Lord, as we recognize the presence of your Spirit in this place today, as we proclaim the mighty name of Jesus in this place, we ask you to move in by the power of your Spirit. begin to touch lives. Begin to challenge us to live for you. Begin to show us the mightiness of your work and your love for us. Begin to Lift us up, Lord, so we can be more like you. Lord, we commit every need to you today that is represented here in this body. Regardless of the need, Lord, we know you are greater and you have the answer. Whether it be physical in nature or spiritual in nature or provisional, direction, whatever, Lord, we right now, we in the name of Jesus, take those needs and in faith we place them before the throne. Asking you, Lord, to touch touch each life and to give direction give healing and most of all Lord help us to commit ourselves to a new and greater level of your spiritual will for our lives presence, Lord, we recognize how little we and ourselves are and how great you are. But we also recognize, Lord, that you love us with such a love that you literally want to just pull us up, set us in your lap, and put your arms of love around us. Speak encouragement. Yes, speak and teach us and challenge us, Lord. But at the same time, Lord, just let us feel the love and the holiness that you have for each one of us here today. Lord, we lift you right now in our praise. We lift you right now in our love. We lift you right now, Lord, to give you glory and honor because you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb of God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. And we bless your name. Would you just lift your hand right now and say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Praise God. <clears throat> uh, we've just concluded a uh, message over the last few weeks uh, on those of you that have been here. We spent about three weeks, I think, on no cheap seats 
and it was in regards to our our living our lives for the Lord and being a blessing to the Lord and what's expected of us as believers. And today, I want to go just a little bit different vein with this uh, as I prayed this week and sought the Lord for this service. Uh, he gave me a, a, a little bit different message than that. And the title of it's up here. Can not really use you. I wonder how many would lift up a hand and say, I've asked that question of myself in my life. Yeah, there's no shame in admitting to that. Can God use me? If we recognize that we were all created with a plan and with a purpose, and the Word of God very specifically teaches us that, then we have to understand that God had a desire and a purpose in creating you to use you for His glory. And you know what? He didn't make any mistakes. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're no mistake. <laughs> now, do it again and say, I'm no mistake. <laughs> There's not a mistake in this room. God didn't foul up when He created you. He had a divine purpose and will for your life. And the biggest problem that we face sometimes is the reality that just as we may know deep down that God has a plan and a purpose for us, the enemy knows that too, and his desire is to steal that victory away from you. Because he doesn't want you to reach your potential in the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Well, let me remind you of something. First of all, he's a liar. If he tells you how worthless you are, you, you, just, you just need to stand in his face and say, look, I'm a child of the king. Yeah. I'm a child of the king. I'm no junk. I was created by God himself. And he loves me. And he has purpose. For my life. But you see, sometimes in this world in which we live, the voices that continuously pull at our spirit and the people around us that continually pull at our spirit are trying to speak negative into our spirit about who we are and why we're here. Never before in history do I think people... There has been more of a struggle with people struggling with depression and all of the different kinds of things that try to pull them down. It's a tool of the enemy and it's very real and it's very powerful. And its whole purpose is to keep you from realizing your value and your purpose in Jesus Christ. Can God really use your life can God really use me? It's a valid question. The answer is an unequivocal yes. But we have to understand that that yes has to come from us. We have to believe. We have to allow the Lord to begin to speak into our spirit the value of our life. And I want to take two passages of Scripture this morning that will help set the stage for what we're going to be dealing with. The ninth chapter of Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 9. I want to begin with verses 1 through 6. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, and it says this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he found, if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him 
he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Continuing with verses 10 through 16, it says, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he was seen. He has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Saul, later as we know him as the Apostle Paul. At this particular point, we would have to say this guy was no friend to any believers. In fact, he was a murderous individual. He was plotted and he used his power and his authority to bring down anyone who called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time I read this story, I stand amazed at the grace of God. Think about it for a moment. This Saul, Paul, that time though Saul, he was as low and as hard and as hurtful and as murderous as any person could be. And it was against those who called upon the name of the Lord. In our humanness, most of us would probably say, well, yeah, God should have just struck him down dead. He should have done away with him. He was no friend to believers. And this is where I become amazed at the grace of God. Yes, he got struck down, but he didn't get killed. And God used this incident to grab his attention. Probably most of us here in this room, if not all of us, would have to admit to the fact there have been times in our life when we really weren't listening too well and God had to grab our attention. You've all heard the story, I'm sure, told about a man watching another man who was trying to get his mule to do what he wanted him to do. And the mule wasn't cooperating. And pretty soon the man grabbed up a big, heavy club and he knocked that mule up the side of the head of that club. And the guy stood back and said, whoa! Probably one of that young might have been one of those animal activists. I don't know. What are you doing there? And the guy looked at him and he says, I'm getting his attention. Sometimes I feel like that. There have been times in my life when I thought, you know what? 
God, I know you're trying to tell me something, and I know I haven't been listening. And all of a sudden, God said, well, here, let's try this. And he's trying to get my attention. He's trying to get me to listen. He's trying to get me to understand he has a plan here, and he has a desire here. And it's my responsibility to listen to him and obey and be his servant. You see, in this story, I see, I see the Lord take this man Saul, save him by grace, and in case you are confused, go back this afternoon and look at the incidences leading up to this and how Saul lived his life, and you'll begin to understand this was an act of grace because this man at this point did not deserve any kind of love from the Lord. He was saved by grace. He was transformed into who he was at that time into a great apostle to the Gentiles. And as I look upon his life and I read the story and the accounts of what took place, it says to me, there is hope for people like you and I to be used of God. If God can use Saul, He can use you. No matter what the devil might try to tell you. When you look at, the, look at this situation in the natural, you cannot help but shake your head and say, you know, Saul was an unlikely candidate to be a servant of the Lord. He wasn't the kind of individual that you would think God would go out and handpick and say, I'm going to use you. He's the kind of person you'd say, God's going to go out and handpick and say, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy you. But that's not what took place. This is a man who was feared and hated by Christians. And one who did everything in his power to destroy the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking complete opposition here. This was a no question, no holds barred situation. Yet God reached down in His grace and took this man from where he was and used him to help change the world. Now I want to, I want to plant something in your spirit right now. I want you to think about this for a moment. In regards to the fact that if God can take a man like this and transform him and use him as powerfully as he used him, what do you think he could do with you? He can do something pretty special. And that's his heart and his desire. God wants to reach down into this room right now by his grace and lift up those of you here today and put his arms of love around you in this moment and speak to you and say to you, you're my child, you're precious, you're special, and I created you with a very special plan and I want to see it come to pass. So let's work on it together for my glory and for my purpose. It's not a maybe thing. It's an assurance of the Lord. As Dennis said a while ago when I looked at him, he knew what I wanted him to say. But he believes it too. It wasn't just because preachers said say it. I'm a child of the King. If you know Jesus as Lord and Savior this morning of your life, you could proclaim that and you should be proclaiming that as well. I'm a child of the King. And if you're a child of the King, you are a royal lineage. And if you're a royalty, I'm going to tell you right now, I want to remind you of something. You have privilege and you have purpose. Don't you let the devil tell you anything different.
And if you cannot say this morning, that's you, I want to tell you right now before this service is over, I'm going to invite you to receive that as unto the Lord and let God transform you into something special and wonderful and begin to outline His plan for you for your life. Change the world. Change the world. God took a few apostles in that day and they turned this world upside down for the cause of Christ. If He can do that with that little meager number, think what He can do with the people right here in this room this morning. We're praying for a mighty move of God in the city of Florence. There's enough people in this room to start it out right now, today, and it'd be something powerful. But you see, we have to begin to understand that God can use us. He can use us. God can use me. God can use you. God can use every person in this room. And that was God's plan all along. There is purpose in your life. Good purpose. That's why the enemy tries to work so much overtime to get your focus off of that and get upon the negative and the impossible. God used Paul's ministry so powerfully. Hear me. So powerfully that it's still reaping fruit today. Wonderful. Precious. Special. Here we are centuries later and it's still speaking to lives. It's still doing what only God can do through that kind of ministry. And you know something? There's people in this room God would like to do the same thing. God can use me. You know, just the mere fact that we're talking about the life of the Apostle Paul. We're talking about the impact he had on this world. It's a testimony to the way God works. It's a testimony to the way God used Paul and is still using him even now in this moment. And when we look at Paul, we may be tempted to think that he was on some kind of a high level, some kind of a, a spiritual plateau. He was something that was to be looked up at and, and blessed and, 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 and admired. And when we do that, then we look at ourselves and we say, Oh my goodness, I understand Paul, but me? Let me remind you, Paul was a man. He wasn't some super saint. He was a murderer. He was a thief. He was a persecutor. He was everything that we look at and condemn in regards to his humanness. How could God use somebody like that? And how could God use me? You know, honestly, I think probably every one of us would have to admit to the fact that we feel inferior. We feel unworthy to be used of God. We don't feel like we really are of a position or a, or a place or a strength or a knowledge or whatever you want to call it and, and, and put it together. We don't feel like we can do that. 
And in this day and age, we have come to, to, uh, to uh, assume or we have come to accept the fact that, yeah, there are those people that God wants to use and God uses them and that's why we bring them into our churches and, well, we pay them a salary. That doesn't happen here. This is a missions work. But we pay them a salary to do the work of the Lord so we can come and just be blessed. That's not the intent. It was never meant to be that way. God wants His people to be actively involved in promoting the Gospel. You say, well, how can I do that? Well, let God speak to your spirit. Let God speak to your heart. Let Him... He designed you. If He had a plan and a purpose when He created you, then there's nothing there that's impossible for God. You're the only one holding up the program. So get in touch with the Lord and let God open the door. He didn't call everybody here to be preachers. Some of you are saying, well, He didn't call you either. <laughs> no. He didn't. You see, every one of you were uniquely and wonderfully and specially made. And God poured into you and placed into you abilities and talents that were unique to you in your life. And He wants to use those. We'd all get really, really bored if everybody was running around trying to do the exact same thing all the time. So God, diversely, made each one of us with a plan and a purpose. He said, I'm going to use you in this way, and I'm going to use you in this way, and I'm going to use you in this way, and I want to use you like this over here. Because when it all comes together like that, it's something very special and very powerful. God's got a plan. You may have asked the question, how can God use me? You can ask that question, but you need to listen to what He says. If we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, and we look at the obstacles... that seemed to be in the way of His service, we begin to realize there was nothing in the natural in this man that should cause him to be used so powerfully of God. And yet God had no problem overcoming those things and pouring into Paul and using Him for His glory. If He can do it for Him, hear me. He can do it for you. Every person here has purpose in the Lord. The short answer that we all need to get into our spirit is the fact that God can use our lives for His glory. And that was His purpose in creating us. From the verses that I read earlier, <coughs> dealing with Paul's life and ministry, I'm wanting to help you understand today that God can show you ways that He can use you. And I want to encourage you to get with the program. Point number one from verse one. It has to do with your past. Most people look at their past as an obstacle.
I remember when God began speaking to me about ministry. And I was not blessed to grow up in a strong spiritual home. I struggled with any kind of a real close relationship with the Lord. I tried several times. Then I would get pulled out of the way. And so when God started speaking to me about ministry, you know, my first response was, <laughs> this can't be God because there's no way God can use somebody like me. I didn't go to... At that time, I hadn't gone to any Bible school or any training in that area. I was just struggling just to even try to feel that I was saved. And my history before that wasn't just a real wonderful one. I had a lot of struggles. A lot of difficult challenges in my life. Physically, mentally, spiritually. I was a bad person. But it wasn't anything that was something real highly special to look at either. And every time the Lord would begin to speak to my spirit about His love for me and His desire to use me, I'd say, ah, now wait a minute, God. Surely this can't be You. Because I'm not worthy of that. Did you forget about so-and-so? Oh, there's so much more suited for that. Talk to them. And God would usually do the same response to me and say, if I wanted to talk to them, I would have already done so. But I'm talking to you. You're going to listen to me. Paul's own testimony. He was guilty of doing everything in his power to put Christianity to death. Acts chapter 22 tells you the story. I mean, he worked overtime now. He was ruthless at what he was set out to do. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, Paul tells us something about his past. Paul was a murderer, he was a rebel against the Lord Jesus. I mean, this guy was ruthless. Religiously, he was a man to be envied. Religiously. But internally, he was as wicked as any man who had ever walked the face of this earth. In Acts chapter 7, verse 58, the Bible indicates that Saul, or what was to be Paul, gave his approval to the murder of Stephen. The stoning. The killing of him. Paul was a wicked man. This was no nice guy. But you see, all of that proved to be no obstacle to the grace of the saving power of the Lord. It was not an obstacle. When Paul received Jesus into his heart, he was changed forever by the grace of God. And it's the same fact for every one of us today here. When we come before the Lord, with a genuine heart of repentance, asking His forgiveness, asking Him to wash us and cleanse us in the precious, His precious shed blood. When we do that, the Word tells us that all things become new. Now we've talked about this before. I Sometimes people have this idea that at that moment, Lightning bolts flash through the sky and thunder rolls and something grabs you and throws you down and when you get up, you are a saint. 
I wish that could be true. And it can be, but I haven't seen it happen that way too often. I underscore the word all things become new. It doesn't say instantaneously new. Become there speaks of a process. But it does say that there is a dramatic change in our life that begins to take place and we begin to walk in a newness that only God can give. We're not the same. Not perfect, but we've turned the direction and we're headed the right way. And we're saying, Lord, have Your will and way in my life. In Paul's case, it was a pretty dramatic, pretty instantaneous change. Because God had a very distinct plan that had to be accomplished. But what I want you to understand this morning is this. Everybody here, if you don't hear anything else from this message, listen to what I'm about to say. Your past is no obstacle to God's future for you. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you haven't done. I don't care what the situation, the circumstance, I don't care how bad you've been. It's not an obstacle too big for God. Because He wants to change your life and use you for His glory. Regardless of your past, before you receive Jesus as your Savior, when you accept Christ as your Lord and you are covered and washed in His precious shed blood and your sins are forgiven, all that past before, it doesn't matter anymore because it's no longer remembered against you. When He saved you, He washed your past. And He washed it away forever. Can you say amen? amen. I don't know about you, but that kind of excites me. Because I'm not too proud of my past. And I like the fact that God's not holding it over me. He's washed it away. In His precious shed blood. And He set me free from that. And it goes the same for each one of us here. It's like we get a, a brand new start at that precise moment. How many of you like new, new beginnings? A <laughs> few of you are honest. <laughs> I foul up enough of my starts that again, I like second chances. I like new beginnings. Very grateful to the Lord for every new beginning that He gives. Sometimes maybe we get a little too dependent upon those new beginnings. But the reality is, God in His love and His grace and His mercy is very anxious to help us turn things around and make it right. John 3 3 and 7 refers to the new birth. That's the spiritual new We're born again and we're changed by the power of God. Let me, let me remind you of something. There are three records of your past deeds in this world today. Three. Let me tell you what they are. First, there is the record of your past that you yourself carry in your mind. People deal with that differently. For some people, it's such a horrendous, negative, depressing thing, it almost completely destroys their life. And for some other people, they think so highly of themselves that they're messed up in that way too.
that every one of us here carries the record of our life in our own spirit and our own mind. Secondly, <clears throat> there is a record carried by all who know you. <clears throat> and especially those who knew you before. You know, I, it's, it's hard to accept the fact that most people out there, especially those that have known you maybe before you became a believer, they remember every flaw. And they're very, very anxious to remind you of that. <laughs> they're very anxious to tell others about them as well. That record, that record stands, it's real. Sometimes it's exaggerated, sometimes it's misunderstood, but oftentimes that record is used by the enemy to tear you down. So you have your own record, your own account, Others have their record and account. And third, there's the record that's carried by Satan himself. And he will throw your past up to you every chance he has. He wants to continually remind you of how worthless and how undeserving you are. How could a God of perfection and love there's no way He could love you. Look at your past. How many of you would say, yeah, I've been there? Yeah. He loves to throw your past in your face because He wants to defeat you with it. Let me remind you even though I may remember my past, my friends and my family may remember my past. And even though Satan surely remembers my past, the great God of heaven has canceled it out. Yeah. It's been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness never to be remembered against you. Again. I believe God deserves praise for that. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's praise Him. <laughs> He's not up there keeping a scorecard and judging it by what you did before. Now He's watching you now. And he's using the Holy Spirit to try to help you make good choices now. But it's not based on what took place before you accepted Him. Because that's all a done deal. It's no obstacle. It's no hindrance to His using you now or in the future. That past is Forgotten. Throughout the Bible, God used people in spite of and after their greatest failures for His glory and for His purpose. Some of you need to quit focusing on the failures and you need to let God direct you to focus on the victories that are yet to come. Let me point out some examples. Simon Peter. He preached his greatest message and had his greatest ministry after he denied the Lord. Think of it. Moses. He was involved in a life 
that was surrounded by turmoil, murder, yet God used him for his glory in the greatest way we, today we look at is the account of his life, and it's a, it's a marvel. Samson, he sinned against God. Yet, the account tells us he slew more Philistines in the end of his life than he had during the entire ministry that he had previous to. Abraham lied. Yet he was used of the Lord. Jacob was a deceiver. Yet the Lord transformed and used him greatly for his glory and for his purpose. And there are many, many, many others that we can find in the Word of God that can be named among these. But these are sufficient, I think, in themselves to show us the lesson and the reality and the truth that the Lord can take those who have failed in the past and that He can still use them for His glory today and in the future. And the rules haven't changed. God wants to use you. And your past conditions are of no obstacle whatsoever. God's looking for people that are willing to say, Here I am, Lord. And not have done it well before, but here I am today. Use me. So your past is no hindrance to you unless you let it be. It's not a hindrance from the Lord. The only time it's a hindrance is when you allow it to be. I don't want to go there. And yes, I've struggled just like probably everyone in this room has. As I said earlier, you know, when the Lord was dealing with me about His purpose in my life, and at the same time God was trying to help me understand, the devil was on the other shoulder saying, <laughs> no, no, no. And you've been there. Some of you are probably there right now. Whose voice are you going to accept? You may say, well, it just doesn't seem possible, preacher. God loves doing what seems to be the impossible. Wouldn't you like for people to be able to look at you in the future and say, wow, what a miracle. It can be that way. God wants it to be that way. What a miracle. I knew that before. And I've seen the change. And I know it wasn't changed because of anything they did. It had to be something miraculous. And wow, what a difference it has made. That's what He wants to do with you. And that's why when we begin to understand that and we accept that and we receive that and we let God begin to work within us, that's why the enemy fights so hard to try to knock us off course because he does understand what the power of God working in our life can, can accomplish. We need to be a people in this hour as children of the kingdom that accepts the responsibility the privilege and the purpose of God over our lives. And quit making excuses 
Uh, yes, I know the enemy will give you all kinds of excuses, and trust me, he can make the worst of it seem like the most unbelievable, or I mean the most believable, and the most truthful thing there is. That's why we need to learn the voice of God, because if we don't, we're going to get tripped up. Because we're going to hear the wrong voice, and He's going to make the impossible seem possible, and the possible seem impossible. See, I look out over this body, and I see a lot of really special people. Some of you said, well, if you only do. <laughs> But the reality is this. God created you with a purpose. And He's stayed close to you all this time, even in the darkest moments, even in the times of greatest failure. And He said, come on. I'm going to help you with this. Because I've got a plan for you. You're my child. You're special. And I want to use you. So don't let the past become the excuse. Because the past is covered in the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to continue this message next week. I feel it's really important because one of the things that I see so often times in the body of Christ today is the fact a lot of people just are afraid to accept the reality that they're special. God created them special. Yeah, we all have our problems. We all have our challenges. We've all blown it from time to time. We've all messed up. But ultimately, God has a plan and a purpose. And the only thing that can keep that from becoming a reality is we are sent. And we're living in a time where the world needs to see a strong Christianity. We are who we say we are. We believe what we say we believe. And we live and act according to what the Word of God tells us to do. We're not playing games. We're not trying to figure out a way to make it say what we want it to say. We're going to live for Jesus. And when we do, God begins to do some marvelous things in our lives. God can use you. God wants to use you. God has a plan to use you. That's the bottom line. And anything that tries to take away from that is a lie. And lies don't come from the throne of heaven. Will it mean that we may have to make some adjustments in our lives so that we line up more according to the Word? Yeah. You know, life is life involves change. But it doesn't take away from the reality that God wants to use you. And you do. We just need to get in line with what He has. And then sit back and say, Wow. I never dreamed. It starts with a real relationship with the Lord. It's not a matter of simply praying the sinner's prayer and saying, Hallelujah! I'm going to heaven now. Let's go to the bar and something else. It's not a get out of jail free card as I keep talking about. It's the beginning of a right relationship with the Lord. And when that relationship is vibrant and real, 
God begins to accomplish great things in our life. That's why when we accept the Lord, there is that presence of the Spirit that so vividly speaks to our heart. And the change is meant to begin. Some of you here today may never have experienced that change. Hear me right now. If you haven't, God wants to give it to you today. Some of you may have experienced it, but somewhere along the line you lost hold of it. You listened to the voice of the enemy that has beat you down, spoken defeat to you, made you feel worthless, made you feel like you're something that you know God could ever love. Hear me. God can fix that. He didn't preach you to live in that defeat. He just wants you to come back to us and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. So where are you at today? Have you been living under the lie of the enemy that is <clears throat> continuously held your past over you and made it seem like it's impossible for you to ever have the victory that God wants for you. If that's you, it's time to put that word belongs under your feet. The Lord will help you do that. He didn't create you to lose. He created you to win. Just lift up a hand. I want to pray for you. Just lift it up. 
As I see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can put it back in. I want to be with you. My final question is this. How many of you today would be willing to admit to the fact that you know that the Lord has spoken to you about His plan and His purpose for your life and for whatever reason you have not accepted that and turned and walked away from it. Maybe it was because you were convinced that your past was too heavy, too dark, you failed too much. And the enemy's convinced you God could not only not use you, He could not even love you. How many of you would slip up a hand right now and say, you know what, I've had those moments in my life and I want God to use me. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, yes, yes. I want God to use me. Yes. I don't want to buy into the lives anymore. I know I'm a child of the King. And I'm not going to accept the defeat that the enemy keeps speaking into my spirit. Yes. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit right now. He's going to speak words of love and encouragement to you. Because that's what He does. He knows your value. And He wants you to know it too. Sing this with Dennis and I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Greater are you who sent me than he who sent 
today who have struggled with this belonging relationship and they've been convinced at least at times that they were unworthy. Some have been beaten up and pushed down by the enemy because he understood far greater than they do of their wonderful value and purpose. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus right now with this body and every person in this room that they began to listen to you as you began to speak encouragement and love power and authority in their life as you begin to prepare them Lord to be used used mightily for your purpose and your plan they began to believe I can be used of God. And they begin to walk in that truth and in that assurance. Lord, I speak a newness over every person in this room right now in the authority of your word. I want them to know how special they are in you and begin to walk and flow in the purpose that you have for them. Lord, change. Change within them their understanding of their value and help them to walk in that newness to them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.